So Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has some of the best use of DLC that I've personally seen in any game that I've played, and the game saw regular updates almost monthly for an entire year. It gave us new rare blades, quests, in-game items, settings, features, new modes, and more to just expand the world of all rest. I still haven't even played New Game Plus, which gives access to the Torn of Blades and a traveling bard system to earn rewards and customize your party level in the base game. Also a new challenge mode which gave us a chance to unlock both Alma, Shulk, and Fiora from the previous Xeno games. I'm still working on Alma, she is so hard. But this mode was complete with the legendary Napan Arch Sage who gave us extra difficult challenge battles with specified criteria to challenge you to think more deeply about your strategy. You could use rewards to buy more outfits including swimsuits which did in fact do more than just look cool. Finally, this slew of extra content all led up to the release of Torna. Now you guys have listened to me throughout this review talking about how Xenoblade 2 is my favorite game of all time right now. Technically that is true, but I actually prefer Torna. I know, they are the same game technically because you access Torna from the main menu of the base game, but since it can also be purchased as a standalone, it's also sort of its own game. It's clear Monolith Soft really took in feedback from fans to both improve and simplify some features from the base game. So I'd like to end this review talking about what was special about Torna and what makes me like it just a tad bit better than the original game. Then we will discuss what we can expect and hope to see next from Monolith and the Xeno series. I purposely left Torna out of the other parts of my review because I knew I had a lot to say about it. Let's talk about all the same aspects of Torna and how they differed from the base game. We will dive into the presentation, music, atmosphere, story, characters, and the battle system. The overall explorable surface area is less, but it actually made it feel a little bit more manageable when exploring. We get to visit Gormont 500 years prior, which was a titan in the base game that I got lost in quite frequently. Other than that, the aesthetics are the same and the settlement of Torgoth is only just forming. The only other titan in the game is Torna, the fabled land which had major significance to the Aegis War as we learned about in the main game. It's one of the most expansive and diverse titans and offers a lot of challenges in its exploration, especially with its great use of verticality. There are many secrets to uncover through its rugged cliffs, thick covered forests, clear white sands, and even vibrant flora of the serene desert oasis. In fact, my favorite part of exploring this titan was seeing the head of the Tornin dragon march through the cloud sea, setting its place as the most powerful titan in the game, a royal crown jewel. This region also hosts a thriving city, Oresco, the royal capital of Torna. Royalty is such a befitting word as the town boasts rich adornments, exuberant townsfolk, and a towering palace headed by a king. The community mechanic is one of the best additions to this fantastic prequel. This feature replaces the development levels from the base game, which we haven't actually talked about in this review, but basically the dev levels measured a nation's growth and your party's reputation. It didn't exist for every town, but the more you bought and sold, the cheaper items became, and more items were unlocked in the shops. Community just felt a little more authentic to the world of Torna and a bit more personal. Since Allrest isn't as established, your focus is more on building a community by helping everyone you came across, rather than trying to spur the economy that doesn't really exist yet, other than Oresco. In this way, you will get to directly help the citizens with personal issues, and the more people you help, the more quests you unlock, which makes your community grow even larger. There may not be any real final reward for maxing it out at level 5, other than an illustration, and the game may have less quests, some not as interesting, but because they were so personal and fewer, it made the world feel more alive and that your actions directly impacted the people of Allrest. There isn't much more to say about the overall presentation as it fits very much in line with the base game. For me, what stood out here would be the incredible music and new tracks that were added. The game really should be called Torna, the jazziest country. I adored the soundtrack of the base game, but the jazzy vibes of the Torna tracks just feel so good. There are only 11 added in total, but man are they good. Picture Gourmet, but with the jazz cranked to 100. This track gets me dancing out of my seat every time and is one of my favorite arrangements. Yes, it still feels like the original theme, but it's even better. I had a hard time playing the game in this region because I would often just stop to take it all in. 
This track has constant tension and release to give you a sense of calm before pumping you back up to continue your exploration. My only critique is that I wish they'd kept some of the choir sections that the original track had, but it's still fast, catchy, and a perfect theme to the soundtrack of your adventure. But oh man, the jazziest of the jazz. It's the jazziest. Yeah, the battle theme. It's so upbeat and if this doesn't get you out of your seat, I don't know what will. The fast piano sections fit in well and the fast lush strings help build up the hype. Xenoblade is known for its heavy rock battle themes, but this one turns it around by featuring no distorted guitar whatsoever. This track made me actively search out every enemy on the map just so I could listen to it again and again. I love the direction they took here and if you aren't tapping along yet, something's wrong with you. This very well could be my favorite battle theme ever. Lasaria has a simple guitar piece that fits the mood for the start of the game as you venture through a forest. The woodwinds provide a nice airy quality of nature. It feels sort of Celtic and like it would actually fit quite well into a fantasy RPG game. This track provides some contrast to the heavily orchestrated tracks in the game, and instead you have some light bongos, melodic flute, acoustic guitar picking, and a little shaker. can't say enough about the main Torna theme. It's hard to describe in words, but this is the perfect theme for this titan in so many ways. When I think of Torna, I think about its importance in the creation of Allrest, in the legacy of the Aegis, the gravity of the aftermath of its destruction and how it shaped both the future of Allrest, but also created Pyra and set everything in motion that would follow 500 years later. That kind of significance is felt throughout this piece. Overall, the track provides a sense of hope for a brighter future, as if the Torn and Titan is asking us to desperately remember its legacy and how it shaped the world forever. I know, deep feels here, but that's truly how this piece makes me feel. Its tone feels royal but modest, sad but happy, damaged but hopeful, all at the same time, and is the perfect sentiment for this beautiful Titan. The ending theme truly put me in tears, especially with how well it set the mood to the actual ending of the game, which we will talk about in a bit. It's also one of the very few songs with actual vocals out of the 200 tracks in this game. It takes a simpler approach similar to the Lasaria theme, with a main acoustic guitar giving us rhythm, and short piano sections with little bursts add a lighter contrast to the heavy hearted feels of this song. The vocals are beautiful and the lyrics fit right into the significance of the journey that we experienced. The string section that plays before the verse repeats exudes greatness. There is an excellent quickly plucked solo section with the guitar that I need to learn. This track is the most moving piece in the whole game in my opinion, and we will touch more on this in a bit when we discuss the ending. Its name is truly a perfect description of this scene, a moment of eternity. This moment is exactly that. was more impactful, the relationships more in depth, and the characters more fleshed out with their own aspirations and struggles to overcome. It's not to say the base game doesn't do this, but just that Torna does it so much better in my opinion. In the base game, you have so many flashbacks and discussions about the Aegis War. You are literally living in the aftermath of the destruction of Torna. But now, you are in Torna, right there in the moment, witnessing everything unfold envisioning how these events shaped the world 500 years later. The overarching story is just more interesting. A great comparison would be Breath of the Wild. 
I know I always bring up Zelda, but it's such a great game to compare to for many reasons. But in Breath of the Wild, we see lots of flashbacks of the destruction caused by the Great Calamity Ganon 100 years prior. We see a thriving civilization burnt to a crisp by an all-powerful being and an army of guardians taking on all of Hyrule. Imagine now a brand new game taking place during that time. It's something I felt was missed potential as the world in Breath of the Wild oftentimes felt a little bit empty. But Xenoblade capitalizes on this with Torna. All those cutscenes we see, all the legends passed down of this great war that the citizens of Alrest and the main characters speak of constantly, we now get to live through it. That was just inherently more enjoyable to me. Because you are living through this destruction, the world feels more authentic because the characters recognize the threat of malice and aren't oblivious. It seems everyone has something to say about what is happening. We meet Mikhail, a little boy in the early game, and his home was destroyed leaving nothing but a smoldering crater nearby. Again, not saying there isn't a looming threat in the base game, but it just didn't feel as dire or imminent. This story felt much closer to the chest, which is in large part due to the incredibly relatable and genuine relationships between the characters, but also that the story didn't take as long to get started. Now with less main characters and rare blades to worry about, Monolith Soft was able to create a cast of characters that truly stand the test of time. Their legacy is felt all the way into the base game, 500 years later, with characters like Jin still struggling with the aftermath and being a shell of his former self. Jin and Laura are absolutely my two favorite characters in the game and I prefer their relationship over Rex and Pyra. Their connection felt so much closer and relatable. I think part of that is they've known each other for much longer, something like 10 plus years, but Jin literally saved Laura when she was a child. It's obvious how much compassion and love Jin and Laura have for one another. What makes it so special though is that we pick up on that more through their actions rather than their words. Jin is relentless and unfazed by any obstacles if Laura is in danger. He risks his life time and time again without hesitation. Laura's compassion as she touches his face and the way they look at each other is just so pure. It's amazing this level of emotion that they were able to create. On a lighter note, I love the design of Laura and her armor too. Now Adam Orego and Mithra at the surface were more comedic in nature, but their relationship is deeper than that. We still see Mithra being her sarcastic self and Adam trying to control her, much like Rex did. But it's also apparent that Adam knows he will never be able to control her completely. Not only through the looks on his face, but also for all the times she cries out to Mithra when she starts to go berserk. It feels more like a father-daughter relationship than anything, but Adam really helps Mithra grow as a character. He sees her through to the bitter end despite how reluctant she is to accept his love and support. Also, Adam Orgo is just such an endearing character. He's like that uncle in the family that everyone loves. He's the oldest of the group but also still has the spark of a child. He has such a charm and charisma that it's no wonder the citizens of Torna adore him. He may be the fourth in line to the Tornin throne, but he is number one in the eyes of everyone else. He is the true Tornin prince. Like Laura, I also love the way his armor looks. It gives off a sense of royalty and dignity. Now the ending. So I've already touched on the ending quite a bit, so let me make my final few points here. In a Dragon Ball Z style battle, we witness Malos and Mithra destroy the land of Torna and cause the death of many of its citizens. Adam was just unable to control the power of Mithra. This destroys her and rips her to her core, forcing her to literally create a persona because she can't deal with the pain of knowing she caused all of this. She hides her feelings behind her new double personality that we know as Pyra. When Mithra and Adam look at each other before starting to cry, I couldn't help but tear up. The look is priceless. It says so much without saying anything. I never felt so empathetic to any characters before. But we end with a feeling of hope for the future and the Tornin legacy, amidst the annihilation of the most powerful titan, Torna the Golden Country. So we've already talked about some of the drawbacks to the combat system as it relates to the base game with my last video in this review, but yeah, it starts off slow and the tutorials are pretty poor and you can't even go back to review them. It has many complex layers and focuses more on battle awareness and adaptability rather than continually mashing buttons. Torna provides a more refined and simplified version of the battle system and feels like a more fully realized version of it. This new system encourages more switching between driver and blade. 
You have a front main attacker position and a back supportive role position. You work more in tandem with one another, even having arts that activate only when you switch. The battles are also a bit faster paced, and there's also the addition of talent arts, which I've heard are similar to Xenoblade Chronicles 1. These typically offer a trade-off between a positive and negative effect. Laura can completely recharge her arts by cutting her health in half at any time in battle. Most of the other mechanics are the same with auto attacks, driver arts, blade specials, driver combos, fusion combos, chain attacks, etc. I know it doesn't sound like much was changed, but all I can say is you have to play it to really get a better sense. All these minor tweaks make this battle system better than the base game in my opinion. The only minor complaint I have is that they made it too easy to attach elemental orbs to the enemies. In the base game, elemental orbs were added after following three blade combos of increasing level and following a specified elemental path. This would also activate a ceiling effect. But in Torna, every blade special used adds an elemental orb, and they added easier paths for the ceiling effects, which still requires three blade specials. This made adding orbs just too easy in my opinion and made chain attacks a lot deadlier and easier to pull off. It really is a minor complaint though. This is the only thing I would consider changing as the rest of the system is refined and adds beneficial new features. Now, what's next for the Xeno series and what's next for Monolith Soft? Xenoblade Chronicles X was my first Xeno game and I completely missed out on the first game, so I patiently awaited a port to the Switch. I was starting to think I'd have to buy it on my Wii U. Luckily, the last Nintendo Direct revealed that a definitive edition of Xenoblade 1 is set to release on Switch this year. I cannot wait to finally finish the trilogy and then I can finally talk more in depth about theories and all kinds of things in the Xenoverse. But after this game, what else does Monolith Soft have in store for us? Well, we do know they are working on a brand new IP as well as a Xenoblade 3 or Xenoblade X2. Luxon, who's another YouTuber, did thorough investigative work and deduced that Monolith has four studios and believes they are working on these two projects, as well as another studio helping on Breath of the Wild 2 and the last one doing ports. I'll leave a link to this video in the description if you want to watch it for yourself. But we've also just seen recently that Nintendo and Monolith are still hiring developers for Breath of the Wild 2. The next Zelda is looking even better, but it's also exciting for Monolith because they will actually have a full staff to work on the next Xenoblade game. Only 40 people worked on Xenoblade 2. Like what? I seriously can't fathom that, but it's true. So I think both Breath of the Wild 2 and either a Xenoblade 3 or X2 are set to be the studio's best work to date. I expect the grandest, most gorgeous worlds we've ever seen. What game do you most want to see next? Personally, I'd love to get a port of Xenoblade X and see a sequel as soon as possible. The ending was one of the biggest cliffhangers ever, and I just loved exploring through the world of Mira. I think with a new sequel set in that style, the online could be a fantastic experience. It was fun for sure, but it was pretty limited, and I'd like to see them create a more robust and streamlined experience for the Nintendo Switch. Xenoblade X departs from the other games as it features more open world exploration and focuses less on a long story driven narrative, not that it doesn't have one. Also be exciting to see what new IP they've been working on as they could literally take it in any direction. I've read articles stating they'd like to make games more in the mature rating and Nintendo seems more open to that than ever and are even censoring less than Sony it seems at times. But it's so hard to end this review because I have so much more that I could still say. So much more love that I could still share. I do hope that we can continue the conversation with one another and I want to hear about your favorite experiences that you had with Xenoblade Chronicles 2 below in the comments. Monolith Soft is full of incredibly talented individuals who clearly value what they are creating. I couldn't be happier that I was able to have this experience share it with all of you, and look to the future at what's next for this incredible series. It is with a humble heart I say thank you to everyone who contributed to this game and to all of you who listened to me pour my heart out about why this is my favorite game. Until next time, long live the Tornin Prince and the legacy of Torna.